Uh, let's start. Uh, today, um, I'm honored to introduce uh, Professor Marcel Suarez at Santos. She's an assistant professor at the University of Michigan, I believe, as of uh, last fall. So her research focuses on the history and the current rate of expansion of our universe, uh, in particular, the, accelera the acceleration of the expansion. Uh, she's been at the forefront of multi-messenger uh, cosmology, um, a rapidly uh, evolving field. She's contributed to the construction of the dark energy camera. And as a member of the dark energy survey, she uses it to do follow-up observations of uh, gravitational wave events. Uh, such as the first binary neutron star merger uh, detected by the LIGO and Virgo collaboration with spectacular results, as we will hear about today. She's also been a leader in more traditional efforts to measure the dark energy of our universe, such as observations of galaxy clusters and gravitational lensing. Uh, she received her master's and PhD in astrophysics from the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil um, in 2010 where she studied cosmological gravitational waves as well as the cosmological evolution of galaxy clusters. Um, she was she moved to Fermilab uh, for a postdoctoral appointment uh, and then later on um, she was an as associate scientist there uh, for her work on DES and uh, in 2017 she held an assistant professorship at Brandeis uh, as well as the Landsman Career Development Chair um, she was awarded the Sloan Research Fellowship in 2019, and after which she moved to, to Michigan, where she's still today. Uh, she is also a member of the Vera Rubin Observatory collaboration and an external member of uh, LIGO. So again, it's a pleasure to have her here, and uh, please take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me. It is really exciting for me to talk about this project. And um, in particular, at this point in time, when uh, there's so many exciting results and the prospect of even more coming. So um, I hope um, I can get a thumbs up that yeah, people can see my, uh, my screen and everything. Great. Um, so um, I would like to start by showing these um, two images here, which are my favorite images of all time, uh, with, taken with the DCAM. Um, and I think that not only these are beautiful images for your enjoyment, but also uh, it already set the stage for the type of challenges that we are going to be addressing uh, in this uh, uh, research. Um, what, what you're seeing here um, on the left uh, here is um, an image taken uh, within the first two days after the GW 170817 margin. So, uh, as you heard um, in the introduction, this um, was the first merger of neutron star, neutron star, neutron star merger um, ever observed. It was seen by LIGO in their gravitational wave data, and um, that triggered our response to scan the air of the sky looking for this counterpart. And uh, you can see here, this little dot marked by the crosshairs is that uh, source corresponding to the merger. Two weeks later, that source is gone. So um, here, even if you're not an astronomer, it is clear that we are talking about um, detecting um, transient objects that are not very bright, not even at its peak brightness, right, compared to uh, other uh, objects here. This galaxy is at 40 megaparsec distance, which for um, cosmology purposes is like here, it's really close. It's, uh, and uh, the challenge becomes even greater when we think about uh, gigaparsecs uh, uh, scale of distances, you know. So it won't be easy, but uh, the payoff, as I hope to convey in this uh, talk, uh, the payoff is big, so it's worthwhile pursuing these and it's uh, quite exciting. Um, I have to say that I um, do wear multiple hats as a member of multiple um, air, air collaborations, but the work I'm going to talk about here, I'm going to focus on the work we've been doing uh, using the dark energy camera and, and in the context of the dark, dark energy survey collaboration. Um, but um, 
as we go towards uh, future surveys with uh, more of more power, uh, we are going to see that this uh, is just the beginning of the story of multi-messenger um, cosmology, as, as I'm, I'm calling it. Okay, so um, let's try to go into the motivation. Uh, why should we bother pursuing cosmology with these uh, novel uh, uh, observables, such as neutron star neutron star motors? Um, the motivation for that is illustrated here in this plot, which is all, all, already a few years uh, old, but um, it's still my favorite version of this plot. What you see on the x-axis is the rate of expansion of the universe today, H naught, and the various dots here are um, different, coming from different observables. Um, I would call your attention for this set of dots of, of measurements here that are from type 1a supernova, and you can see first that it's absolutely impressive the fact that these arrow bars are only a couple percent wide. This is really, really an achievement of the supernova community. And uh, the other thing that I would like to call your attention to is that compared to measurements made using the cosmic microwave background, there is a significant discrepancy. At the time of this paper, this was at four sigma or so, but today, depending on what data sets that you combine, it is greater than five sigma um, and the discrepancy is getting uh, bigger and bigger as the measurements get more and more precise. So every time we see discrepancies like that in observational data, it is possible that uh, there are systematic uncertainties unaccounted for. Um, now, that possibility is something that um, the community uh, exploits it as well, trying to minimize the systematics, trying to find uh, clever ways of uh, uh, cleaning up the data and so on. Um, we think that um, those systematics are well under control at the level of sensitivity of, of precision of these measurements here. So if it's not systematics, then it must be new physics, right? And um, by new physics, what I mean here is that something is happening to the universe between the uh, redshift 1000, where the CMB uh, signal is coming from, and the observations that are happening at redshift 1 of the, of the supernova. And um, that could be um, a, a smoking gun of um, what is the physics of the of dark energy that causes the accelerated expansion of the universe. And in order to illustrate that, I'll call your attention to these arrows up here. So we often parameterize dark energy in terms of this uh, equation of state parameter, W, that relates the pressure and density of this cosmic fluid uh, that causes accelerated expansion of the universe. This is the value of W today. This is the first order derivative. If cosmological constant is, um, is the dark energy, then this would be a W naught would be exactly equal to minus one, and this would be exactly zero. But if we change from cosmological constant to um, a more general dark energy uh, model by only 10%. This is by how much the Planck result from 2015 would move towards agreement with the supernova results. I, of course, that uh, this plot being made by a, an expert in, uh, from the supernova field, the arrows go this way, but you, you get the picture. Agreement can be achieved um, by um, a, changing here the physics and this is really um, relevant to us because uh, we really would like to know what dark energy is so if there is an observational signature like this um, we really want to understand them uh, and new independent measurements are a key component of this because they will be sensitive to different sets of systematic uncertainties they will be independent and they would allow us to really verify and what is going on here with this measurement. So this is uh, the motivation behind a vast program that includes pursuing better measurements with supernova, includes finding new ways of calibrating the measurements and also new CMB measurements and so on. It's a rich uh, field to try to disentangle this. And the gravitational wave program is a new, um, I, I would say a new component of that. Okay, so let me introduce um, a little bit the Dark Energy Survey that is uh, a, a collaboration that is very close to my heart. 
the DES survey was designed as a survey for uh, cosmology, but without counting on gravitational waves. That, that was not in the picture at the time that the survey was being planned. The plan there was to observe galaxy clusters, galaxies, supernova, and use these multiple probes of dark energy to measure um, a, the universe's uh, history of expansion and history of growth of structures. To do that, the, sur the survey collaboration built the dark energy camera, DCAM for short. What you're seeing here is a focal plane of the camera with um, the science CCDs um, exposed. This image was taken at the lab um, before we uh, shipped it to Chile for installation on the telescope uh, several years ago by now. Uh, the camera is operational since um, 2012. And um, DES finished its observations in uh, 2019. And right now what we're doing, uh, I mean, the camera is still there and operational and being used by the community for other projects, but the DES survey proper uh, finished its observations in 2019 and we're doing a number of analysis uh, uh, of the data. Um, the gravitational wave component of this program uh, this began much later in 2015 when we uh, partnered with uh, the LIGO collaboration to pursue counterparts such as the w 17 Results from DES are already um, coming out. Uh, in particular, I would like to call your attention to, this is just one plot of one of many papers, I'm not going to dive into, into that, but I want to call your attention here because um, here what you see is measurements of omega m, the amount of matter in the universe today. Um, and here is um, S8, which is a combination of sigma h and omega m, uh, meaning it's a measure of the clustering of galaxies. And this region here is one in two sigma results from Planck, so CMB based. And here is the result based on the ES data, only the galaxies. And again, the level of tension here is very far from the, you know, very significant four or five sigma level that I showed before in the, the case of H naught. But in this part of the parameter space, you're starting to see some tensions popping up. And um, more than that, these tensions, they are not going away with more analysis and more data. So uh, I really encourage people, if, if you want to see the latest version, of this analysis, uh, have a look at the latest results from DES, which are coming out just now uh, um, as we speak, uh, as uh, we, we show uh, interesting results there. So the motivation that I showed, I'd like to start with the H0 attention because that's the, the biggest, most striking one, but it's everywhere in the promise space of cosmology. So it's really worthwhile for us. If we really want to go to the next step into understanding dark energy, we really want to get to the bottom of this. So how do gravitational waves play a role in this? Um, I um, would like to, to show this. I, I don't expect you to read all of this uh, uh, here on the fly, but I'd like to highlight this paper because it's uh, my dream to get to a point where I write papers like uh, Bernard Schutz does. Um, short, straight to the point, just a few equations, no figures and a hell of an impact, right? Um, this, um, in this paper in particular, he highlighted the idea that we could measure the Hubble constant using gravitational wave observations in a, in a relatively simple way, right? So um, the idea here is that uh, if you take just the quadrupole formula of general relativity for two objects uh, in an orbit that will decay over time, um, you can compute, I, I like to start with uh, equation number two here, um, the, you can compute the rate of change in frequency, the FDT, um, as the system's orbit uh, 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 decays. And that this quantity is a function of a combination of the masses of the two objects in the binary. Now, what is really interesting is that you can also compute what is the intrinsic amplitude of the waves that are being emitted by the system. And this quantity is also proportional to a combination of the masses. And more than that, it's the same combination with the same powers everywhere, but inverted. So what this means is that in practice, if you build a detector and, and, and can see these waves, 
you can measure the rate of changing frequency. And by doing that, you are measuring the rate, the, the amplitude of uh, the, the gravitational radiation um, at the source. So you have a standard uh, firing as opposed to a standard candle uh, intrinsically there. You can, the next step is just to compare this amplitude with the amplitude that you have in your detector and then boom, you have the distance between the two. So this is a very clean measurement compared to what we typically do in astrophysics. You know, to get to the distance to an object, we use a supernova, for example, uh, the level of complexity of the, the, the astrophysics that you have to take into account to extract that information is enormous in comparison to this, right? Now, of course, that the problem is uh, being able to detect the gravitational wave signal from those sources. And that challenge is something that it took a long time to get there, but the community, the gravitational wave community has, has uh, succeeded in this. What I'm showing here is um, the challenge that, it, that it, this uh, program uh, has from the point of view of somebody using traditional telescopes attempting to find the optical counterpart. Um, so I, I should, should say one thing that you want the optical, why do you want the optical counterpart, right? You want the optical counterpart because you want to build a distance versus redshift relation to measure your eight pot measure uh, uh, value, similar to what you would do with supernova. The distance part I showed here, that, that's how you get it. But the redshift information you're going to get with traditional observations of um, uh, the source itself or the host galaxy where the source lives, okay? So for that, you need to find which galaxy out of, uh, you know, uh, millions uh, is the source. And this is uh, to quantify how difficult that is to accomplish. Uh, on the x-axis is the uh, uh, localiz probability, localization probability in the sky. And in the y-axis is uh, the size of that area. So in this side here is the case where you have two uh, gravitational wave detectors, the two LIGO detectors. And here is when you add Virgo, the third detector. And what you're seeing here is that these areas, so say, um, summarizing here, for 90% confidence in localization, you need to cover an area of approximately 60 square degrees, which is um, challenging. Imagine that VCAM, for example, one of the widest field view cameras out there has three square degrees. So um, it is a, a, a challenging proposition to scan such an area, especially if you're talking about looking for something that is faint, as I showed on the title slide, it's faint and it is um, a short lived, right? But uh, as I will show uh, uh, later, this is, um, this is doable. It's challenging, but it's doable. So how do we address this challenge? Well, what we did here, uh, we were in a very fortunate situation when we started thinking about this project because we already had the camera and we uh, already had you know the camera the telescope and we already had a pipeline for processing those images usually when you start a new project you have to, to build those three things right and we already had that what we needed to do was to adapt so that um the processing would be uh in any area in the sky as opposed to the designated fields that we had for supernova science before so uh, here is a, a description, um, a picture showing um, how our pipeline works. So we listen for triggers from LIGO saying, look over there, that's our region in the sky. We have an automated um, a software that creates the observing plan and sends that to the mountaintop. Then uh, the images are taken, the diffuse imaging pipeline subtracts that against the reference imaging images and produce a list of candidates that you then publicize. Um, here is an idea to, to give an idea of the processing times, how long it takes. And uh, this is uh, some of the people who worked on, on making this pipeline possible. Um, so let me show um, how this works in a real um, a, um, data in the, in the case of 2017 um, oh, I, I should mention this that um, we are not the only ones who are pursuing this. When the LIGO collaboration sent an announcement calling the astronomical community to team up and um, try to pursue the, the counterparts of the events they were going to see, the community responded with 
a, a lot of excitement. So each name here is a collaboration. Uh, the paper that came out at the end was uh, with thousands of authors, which uh, for people who work on um, LIGO or even in Collider experiments, uh, maybe a thousand collaborators in a paper is not uh, something new. But for me, it was the first time I worked with so many people in a single paper. Um, so it helps when looking for an electromagnetic signature. It looks, it helps to know what are the physical mechanisms that are producing that signature, right? So here is an illustration. I'm not going to be entering detail, just refer you to some references. There are many others um, about the, 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 the processes, but there are two basic processes that matter for us. Um, one of them are is uh, relativistic outflows. So particles being accelerated because of the uh, uh, very strong magnetic field in the systems. And this is non-thermal beamed emission that will be bright and short, uh, it will be bright in gamma ray, radio and um, in, in X-ray, okay? This is great, but it's not really um, what I'm interested in. I'm more interested in the sub relativistic outflows. And here the story is, um, some of the neutral star material gets disrupted in the moments before the merger. And that tiny amount of mass, a percent of the solar mass or so, um, will then go through nuclear reactions that will um, heat up this material. So you are going to have thermal and nearly isotropic uh, emission um, where the brightness and, and the particular specific characteristics of the light curve that you're going to detect will depend on the mass ejected, the velocity of that ejector, and the uh, opacity of the material, okay? But overall, these will be bright in wavelengths that our camera is sensitive to. So for 2017-0817, you probably have seen this, big, this particular slide many times. Um, it, uh, this was um, the moment of uh, the, the the birth of multi messenger astronomy with gravitational waves, right? I think with neutrinos is a different story. But with gravitational waves, this was the first time. And uh, the illustration here is the chirp signal uh, in gravitational waves train. Uh, zero here is the time of the merger. As I said, uh, if you want uh, to think about the, the determination of the distance, when I talked about measuring the rate of change in frequency, that's the, the plot that you're talking about here, right? Um, so, um, on the other hand, you have here and here uh, gamma rays that were detected just two seconds after that. And honestly, if the story of 2017 would have a, had ended here, it would already have been a success, you know, because it was the first time that this uh, a, a multi messenger uh, type of multi messenger event had been detected. I wouldn't have been so happy because I don't work on those wavelengths. But, uh, luckily, there was more. Um, after that um, detection, the challenge was to find the counterpart, the localization area of um, the gamma ray uh, uh, satellites is, is not great. And so combined uh, all together, you ha we had this area here to search. Okay, and this is a zoom region of that from a paper by uh, in this other group here. Uh, they did, they were using a small telescope with a narrow field of view. So uh, their strategy was to look at a pre existing catalog of galaxies in the region of interest, rank those galaxies by some criterion, and uh, observe uh, in individually those galaxies in this order here. Okay. Um, for us, that um, strategy that was used by the SWOP team was not uh, viable. And the reason for that is that the field of view of our camera is this big, you know? So um, it, it does just didn't make sense. For us instead, our best strategy was just to tile the entire region. And we did that multiple times and, um, and, and cover, cover everything and do the processing as I described previously. We did that. Uh, and this is an illustration. This is the region of the sky. Again, 50%, 90% probability contours. And uh, the red hexes correspond to the footprint of the camera on the sky. Um, we had um, observers 
in Chile doing uh, uh, during the, the observations, and also at the remote operation center at Fermilab. Um, so we began the observations, and soon after uh, we uh, found this image. I keep saying this to my uh, collaborators and friends: pay, pay attention to what you write in your emails. You never know where a screenshot of it will appear. Um, but uh, I should say that um, this was really an exciting moment when uh, we realized that we had a candidate. Okay, and uh, this candidate was found. Um, uh, by by eye, so this situation here was peculiar because this object was so close. Um, so even though we had our pipeline processing images, we could also look at the raw images and, and try to find it, and that's how this um, a candidate was initially found. So as soon as that happened, I am there typing as quickly as I can in order to report the finding of this candidate. When I realized that the swap team the, uh, uh, that I showed before had seen it first. They beat us by approximately nine minutes or so in, in reporting this. So we found it independently. Here's uh, uh, their image uh, and um, it, the source is here. Um, I think it's, uh, it's, a little, it's a little bit blurrier, but it's there. Um, and uh, it is um, exciting to see that um, in, this, in this area, in this new field, uh, even with a, a Smaller aperture telescope. Um, there was a lot of impact we had in this area, so that's that's uh, exciting as well. So not only uh, the our team and SWOP, but also several other teams uh, observed this uh, counterpart. Is there a question? No, I, I don't think so. Ah, okay, sorry. But and and these are, are some of the papers that reported independently the discovery of the same counterpart. Now you may ask the question. I was saying early on that it was challenging and etc. Well, cannot have maybe it was not so challenging, right? If if so, if, uh, so many groups were able to see this. Um, the aspect here that is important is that this event was really close in comparison to what we expect. We expect a typical event to be at 100 megaparsec, not at 40. So um, one of uh, the, the, the key components here, when I say it's challenging to do this, is that we need to be prepared to do this at 120, maybe even 200 megaparsec, not uh, uh, necessarily only at 40 megaparsec. So one question is, OK, if this would be at 100 megaparsec, would you be able to see it? Um, another question you may ask as well is, um, OK, you showed one galaxy and you showed a source there. Convince me that this is the counterpart, right? So we addressed those questions in this paper uh, in where we uh, push uh, on the entire analysis. I can go into this more if you want to ask questions. But just to um, uh, summarize, um, we showed that um, that one candidate was really the only candidate that remained after we applied the series of uh, analysis cuts. And um, we demonstrated with simulations that we would be able to see this at much greater distance, uh, even twice the, the range of expected events. Now on to cosmology, I, that was the main motivation. Can we do a Hubble diagram uh, with one data point? The answer is yes, although not a very good one. <laughs> what you see here is the result of the um, H naught measurement we're using that one event. The posterior distribution is shown here. And for comparison, these are the these bands show the supernova and the CMB results. As you can see, we are not in the land of precision cosmology here, but the results are consistent with the other measurements. And this is one event only. So it is a good sign that we at least get consistent results. Another question that comes often is okay, this was the H naught parameter. Uh, how much of an impact should I expect from this new observable on, uh, you know, the overall parameter space of cosmology? And this is uh, an attempt um, by um, a, my group to, to try to answer this. What we did was DS results from the Y1 cycle of analysis. If we add a few gravitational wave events, and this was eight that I added, um, all similar to the W170817. And this is showing uh, by how much the parameter space will change by uh, adding just a handful of events, which I think is 
it looks promising and, and, and interesting for the future. Now, I have been talking a lot here about mergers of neutral stars. That is great because there is a mechanism for emission of radiation that is in the wavelengths that is that we can detect. And that is the reason why much of the focus of this type of research has uh, has been in uh, neutral star to star mergers. But we have seen that black hole black hole mergers are more abundant in the LIGO data by a factor of almost 100 uh, with respect to neutral star to star mergers. So wouldn't it be great if we could use them for cosmology as well, right? So um, we have been pursuing uh, searches for the electromagnetic counterparts of those events as well. These are two examples. We have not found any counterpart yet, otherwise I would be um, reporting on those. And, but we can use them for cosmology as well. The idea, which uh, I will skip ahead to, to in the interest of time here, uh, to illustrate this with um, one analysis of a particular black hole, black hole merger event, uh, GW1708-14, so it happened uh, the same week as the big neutral star event. Uh, we call these events um, dark sirens because the idea is that they don't necessarily emit um, a, yeah, uh, radiation. Um, what you see here is the region of interest, 50% is the inner one, 90% is the outer region uh, for uh, this particular event. And this uh, color code in the background corresponds to the distribution of galaxies from DES. And as you can see, there is a tantalizing overdensity here close to the region of uh, high probability. So the idea here is that galaxies are not distributed randomly in the sky. So if I assign a probability of being a host to each galaxy and I compute the overall H naught posterior using those galaxies, I can get a, uh, a measurement uh, that is going to be less precise on an event by event basis than in the case where you can assign a one to one relationship between galaxy and, 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 and merger. But it is, uh, um, it, there is signal there. And because the statistics is much greater here, maybe we are going to get uh, to, uh, to signal. So that's the, the gist of the idea. And here's an illustration of the first. Um, Marcel, you, you cut out just for three seconds just now. Um, oh, just, just okay. right before you me, switch slides. Yeah. Okay, so let me. Um, all right, let me go back a little bit. Um, did you get, get the part where I mean, it cut off when I was you, about to switch? Yeah, from you, you showed you, you talked about the 90 and 50% contour and uh, using the fact that the galaxies are not randomly distributed, but using the overdose. Okay, yeah. okay, great. So um, in, in practice then, if each potential host of the merger has you know, a probability of, of, of being host and has a redshift associated with it, I can construct the likelihood analysis and uh, get a measurement of H naught. That measurement is expected to be less precise than in the case where you can identify the counterpart one-to-one, -one, but it is a measurement. And um, that is what um, I'm showing here. This slide is showing the result of the first uh, measurement of H naught, although with a huge uncertainty, as you can see, but it's the first measurement of H naught using a dark siren. And we used this technique uh, in 2019, and uh, we obtained this posterior here for comparison in gray is the posterior that we got to 2017 as you can see, it's much wider, but uh, there is a measurement there, and that is, um, I, I think it's really exciting because it's, it looks like the idea works, and it will be um, a way of doing this measurement. So now, this is the last uh, um, result that I'm sh showing from the events that we observed in 2017. Since then, we had another observing campaign um, that we labeled the O3, observing campaign number three, um, where a number of additional uh, gravitational wave events were detected by LIGO, 50 plus uh, events, okay, of which um, a fraction 
was uh, potentially containing at least one neutron star. So what the what have we uh, been up to with these events, right? Uh, we are trying to, we have tried to discover uh, electromagnetic counterparts for those, but selecting the subsample of these events that would be more interesting. So here I'm going to talk about today, um, two of those events. One of them is a binary, was a binary neutral star merger of low significance, uh, and we invested one night of, of data on it. Um, and the other one was uh, the first merger that we believe might have been a mix between neutral star and black hole. Um, and um, this one, the localization area was much smaller. Look at this, 23 square degrees. So we invested more time to cover the entire area and, and pursue a deeper search. So what have we found? Um, okay, before I show that, uh, just showing this sky maps, localization areas of each of those. We found lots of candidates. So the, the dots here represent individual candidates that we found in each case, but none of them confirmed, turned out to be the counterpart, okay? So the conclusion from that is that uh, these bright sirens we are talking about, um, they are probably not that bright, <laughs> okay? Um, if they're there, you know, if, if the mechanisms that uh, were at play in the w 17 were also at play here, um, you know, um, probably, let me quantify what I, what I, what I want to, to say. Um, here, this plot helps quantifying it. This is mass, the ejected mass uh, a, 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 from the binary a shortly before it collapses. This is the velocity of the ejected. In, um, um, as I said, it's up to about a 0.3 C. And each of these panels corresponds to a different value of uh, a lanthanide fraction that translates into opacity, okay? For GW 170817, we know that in the first 48 hours, the best fit parameters in these three parameter space here was here. That's this box highlighted here. So if this event would have been exactly like 170817 and would have occurred in the region of the sky that we observed, we would have seen it, okay? And the fact that we did not see it uh, is, is significant from, from that point of view, okay? Um, but of course, that we don't know how typical the 170817 was. It could have been that the mass ejected was much smaller down here or the opacity was higher or, or, or any other combination. So that's why we transformed this into this uh, a, a parameter space using simulations to try to quantify uh, uh, you know, how much of this parameter space we covered and try to, to put numbers to, to, to our non-detection. More details are in this paper by uh, my uh, graduate student, Alisa Garcia. Uh, we did the same thing for 1908-14-BV. Um, and here, the challenge is greater because this event is much further away than uh, the previous one. And here we have only, at the most, one neutron star, not two. So we likely are in a scenario with the smaller masses. Um, but again, we covered a part of the parameter space and uh, again, we didn't see anything, no, no counterparts. So what do we do next? Well, what we did here was to invest a little bit more on this uh, dark sirens uh, cosmology. And um, we did an updated version of that dark sirens measurement, now using several events uh, in combination. And what you see here in red is the result of the combination. Um, the gray is again, uh, GW 170817 alone. And um, blue is um, a, the previous events, you know, and, and we just combine, combine them together. The combination of all events is, uh, is this one. So the dark events that are the blue ones, they are um, individually, they're not as good as one bright sign, but they help tightening uh, of the parameter space. And so we think it's worthwhile investing in more events. Uh, our next step would be to try to do this, not with onesies and twosies, but with a sample of hundreds of events, which uh, 
going at the pace that the LIGO collaboration has been making improvement, we think it's likely we will be able to succeed um, in the near future. Um, so um, I would like to show a little bit of uh, prospects for the future. So this is simple estimate that I made um, almost by hand here. I'll, I'll, I'll describe what I did here. So on the top panel, um, I did the following. Um, we, after the 2019 uh, 2020 campaign, this is the, the, the typical number of binary to sum merger events that uh, uh, we were expecting to have, okay? And we are in fact, somewhere in between in, in here, actually more close to the top of this uh, than the bottom, okay? I made this plot before we started the season, so it was an estimate based on previous data. And as we go along, we expect to rise here, note that this is a, a log scale. Uh, we, we expect more and more events to be detected because of uh, two reasons. One is that the detectors from LIGO, the LIGO detectors will become more and more sensitive and another one is also uh, we expect them to be running um, longer, more, more efficiently. So uh, this is the curve that we expect. The band here represents some uncertainty on the overall rate, intrinsic rate of these events in the sky. Okay, and notice that uh, we are expecting in a time scale of nearly five or six years uh, to have reached a point where we have about a hundred neutral star events. And you can imagine that for black hole events, this is uh, an order of magnitude, at least one order of magnitude more, okay? If not two orders of magnitude more. So this is fantastic. We are going to have statistics, you know? And if we are able to convert these events into observations with electromagnetic counterparts, so this is uh, assuming that these are all bright signs, um, this is uh, the route that we expect just by scaling by square root of n, the uncertainty on H0 that we obtained with 2017 And you can see that the boundary to cross here, the level of precision of supernova today, it's only a few years. And I find this really impressive. I uh, earlier um, was in a discussion with some of the graduate students and, um, you know, if you think that, four, maybe six years is uh, the, the, the time that you spend, you know, at, in your PhD. Um, see, it's very rare that you see a, a field making this much progress in, a, in that time scale, you know. At, in, um, so I think this is fascinating and I'm really excited about it. Here on the side, I'm just showing a scale of um, uh, more or less uh, approximate uh, timeline for uh, the ground-based observatories that will help us get, you know, uh, this will work only if you get a significant fraction of these events to have counterparts, right? Uh, so these are some of the surveys that will be operational then. Um, and this progress here is not counting on the dark sirens helping, right? It's only the bright sirens alone. So I think that this is exciting prospect and uh, I am particularly looking forward to this, okay? So this is my very last um, slide. Um, in summary, the DSGW uh, project is a um, program designed to do search and discovery of electromagnetic counterparts of gravitational wave events. We were successful with 2017-0817. This was spectacular results, something that we are very proud of. Um, I should say it remains today as uh, the most cited paper that has the DES collaboration on it is uh, um, you know, the paper from, from, uh, from this project. So I'm very proud of being uh, um, a, the person that uh, spearheaded this project within DES. Um, the discovery of 2017 or was uh, a mo uh, really um, a, the beginning of a rich program. Uh, we also pursued uh, in the third um, observing campaign we pursued as well uh, black hole events. We didn't find counterparts of those, um, but we began using them for measurements of cosmology as well as dark sirens. On an individual basis, they are not as good as bright sirens, but they are likely to help as well because they are so uh, numerous. Um, our results from the third observing campaign, which I showed very briefly here, I really encourage people to look at our papers, 
Um, those results um, include um, better searches, um, use of the detailed simulations to constrain the parameter space in a, a quantitative way that we didn't have before, and uh, the cosmology measurements using bright and dark science combined. So that's all I have. Um, I will uh, be happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Marcel, for a very nice talk. Uh, impressive results and exciting prospects. Um, so yeah, thank you uh, for everyone. Um, so uh, please raise your hand um, using the Zoom reactions. I think we, all, we already have one raised hand for, from Masha Baryakhtar. Hey, uh, thank you for the uh, wonderful talk. It's really exciting. Uh, could you talk a little bit about uh, what you expect the, the limitations to be as you continue? I mean, it seems like there's, you know, um, there's going to be a huge amount of data and statistically you expect uh, really great improvements, but what, what do you see as kind of the challenges going forward with this um, systematics or anything else? Mm -hmm. oh, thank you for this question. I, um, yeah, in, in the beginning, especially when I showed how clean you make a measurement of distance from uh, uh, the gravitational wave signal, um, it, it may be a little bit misleading that there, there's, oh, no systematics to, to, to worry about. In fact, um, as soon as we get those uh, uncertain, you know, those uh, posterior distributions to be a little bit narrower, we will begin uh, to, to, to run um, in, into trouble with systematic uncertainties as well. I think that in particular for the dark sirens part of the analysis, that analysis um, suffers from similar sources of systematics as any large scale structure type uh, you know, analysis, so two point correlation functions and so on. So things like sample uh, selection of the galaxies and of the gravitational wave events will uh, play a role. Another uh, component is um, redshifts. Here we did this analysis using photometric redshifts from DES. And if there are biases in those redshifts, you're going to get biases and propagated into your measurement too. And um, all of those currently, the posterior is so wide that any that we can get away with a lot, but soon that will not be the case. So the way I see this pro program going forward is that we are going to have uh, a number of challenges um, that are similar in nature to the type of challenges that we've had uh, in SDSS, the yes, DESI, you know, when doing a uh, large scale structure analysis, which on one sense is unfortunate because um, I would rather live without them, but um, it's not too bad because we as a community have a lot of experience already facing those types of systematics. So I think we'll be able to borrow many techniques that are used to mitigate the systematics there. Uh, I think we'll be able to employ them here too. Thank you. Uh, next question, I think Mike Lenton. Hi, thanks. That was great. Um, I yeah, I had a very related question to your answer actually, which was, what you know for the projections you're making um, for the dark sirens, what what is the redshift distribution of that population? The expected redshift distribution. I, it's another way of asking like, what 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 kind of spectroscopic redshift survey would actually support it? Yeah, that is um, a very, very good, good question. So you will notice that in the projections that I showed, I was uh, working primarily with the uh, um, uh, bright sirens, which would have counterparts, you know. Um, for the dark sirens ones, that is something where um, we're still working on, you know, a version of those plots that uses the dark sirens. Uh, there, the way I am currently, and actually I welcome your input in that because maybe I'm being naive, but the way I, I'm currently modeling that is to just assume, so say I take a simulated uh, set of galaxies from uh, a, a DES simulation, for example. And I assume that, um, the galaxies have um, 
all, all have the same probability of being the host of a given event within within that region of interest, you know. And um, I've tried weighting that by the luminosity and say, okay, more uh, more mass means more um, uh, uh, probability of ha having uh, the event, right? And then, um, but that made some impact, but not too much, right? And um, and that was um, basically the way I, I've been working with so far. And not in, I'm introducing the horizon that the LIGO experiments have as a simply um, step function. You know, I say, okay, they can see events up to here and then not, not anymore, which I know it's not a good approximation, but that's, that's just the very simplified way we've been working uh, with that so far. Right. So, but what is that horizon? Like, what I guess I just don't even know. Like, what is that horizon in the next few years? Oh, okay, okay. That's just a half, 0. 0.5. Okay. All right. Yeah. Um, okay. Marianne, thanks. Who's next? Sorry. Thank you. Because also, it depends on the mass, right? So, um, for this is the part that is quite exciting is that we are learning that there are mergers uh, that are a lot more massive than we had anticipated. So uh, we are already, for example, this event that I showed, um, the 19, can you still see my slides here? I don't know. Yes. Uh, yeah. So this event um, here in the Morgan et al. paper, this event was already at redshift point three. So um, these are relatively high redshift events. Yeah, so it's gonna be super hard to have much of the sky. I mean, you'll have the Desi area. Yeah. And that's, yes. That's so what I hope, if we can demonstrate that this is really a viable route, what I would hope that we can do is have um, perhaps a dedicated program that goes, um, for this, you don't have to do target of opportunity necessarily, right? You can accumulate the events over time, say, two years, and then select the best ones and design a uh, observing campaign where you go in the regions of interest of these events and do with a target selection that you design, you get, get those. And then maybe, you know, a survey like that over three years, you can do, you know, instead of trying to put it as yet another thing that a multipurpose big thing does, perhaps designing something specifically for this science case would be more uh, appropriate. Even if you use the same facility that already exists for some other survey, right? Um, but you would uh, perhaps just design the observing strategy to optimize for this. That makes a lot of sense. Thanks. <laughs> Mariam. Yeah, thank you. I mean, it's actually my question or comment is similar to what has been discussed in terms of the spectroscopic uh, facilities. So right, I mean, you mentioned that I mean, that would be really great for the dark sirens to just go after because now it's no longer, um, you know, since there's no electromagnetic counterpart to catch, you can, you know, the galaxies will be around for millions of years. So you can do that. Now, my question about um, for, the, for the bright signs, for the neutron star mergers, um, you know, I, that's also kind of my community, the supernova community, you know, I, for me it was kind of almost spectator sport to see um, you know, all these trends and they would get spectra, it's another boring 1A. <laughs> um, so, so can you comment a little bit on that? I mean, I know other ones like Groves, they have, you know, really dedicated also spectroscopic facilities. Um, mm -hmm. It's not only enough to find it, you know, photometrically, but just figuring out what the fingerprint is. So could you comment mm -hmm. on that moving forward if the ES has collaborators or other kind of facilities mm -hmm. for spectroscopic? Yeah, yeah so in in 03, the uh, third uh, campaign, so what we did was, um, and this, okay, so DES for the supernova program, um, you, you know how, how it goes, right? Number of proposals that uh, were put in for uh, a spectroscopic support of uh, the supernova program. So we took advantage of that in the sense that a number of uh, uh, people in, in our team had uh, that experience and we were, um, successful also partnering, uh, partnering up with non-DS members to uh, get time on uh, Gemini, SOAR, and so on, to go and target candidates so that we could, could confirm them. 
at the end, um, this was, I mean, it would be successful if we had discovered another counterpart. We did, right? So, um, but I think that the exercise of um, uh, securing those resources for that follow-up program, that was, a, I think, a success. It, it worked well. I was happy with, with the result. Um, the problem that you may ask is, will that scale? in the future, you know, because right now we are still in the land of onesies and twosies in, in the sense that, um, you know, it's very few events, but we would like to make this into an industry or, uh, you know, the same way as we do with Supernova. And then I think um, we would benefit a lot of something a little bit more organized and dedicated, but um, I don't know what what shape that, that will actually take. I know that a number of other teams um, are pursuing, um, transients uh, in general and these ones in specific using different types of resources but i am worried a little bit that these are fainter you know at the regime where we are going they're fainter than the regime that they can achieve in the with the existing resources you know and that will be another challenge um next question from glennis Hey, Marcel, it was so lovely. The Dark Siren stuff is coming along so phenomenally well. I can't believe it. Um, I mean, I can believe it, but it's just amazing. Uh, I mean, that it's happening so, so yeah. fast. And the idea of using the galaxy distributions is really beautiful, so congratulations. Um, I wanted to pursue this question of efficiently finding counterparts for neutron, binary neutron stars and neutron star black holes. And in particular, as you surely know, and maybe you mentioned, I, I missed the very first bit. Um, the, there's a, a pretty solid theoretical argument that the accretion disks of AGNs would, would facilitate uh, formation of binaries and, and their mergers. But if an event is happening on top of the nucleus of an already very bright HN, you have to devote much more um, observational attention to that system to decide if there was a change. Also, of course, mm -hmm. the complication that you have to have been, you have, well, afterwards at least, you would want to keep monitoring in detail the AGN um, to see how variable it is, whether that might just be a fake. Mm -hmm. And I'm, yes. I, at the time of the, the last, the neutron star binary uh, black hole merger, um, I looked at it because uh, one of our faculty members at NYU Abu Dhabi and I, and of course, uh, uh, Injun Zah was the lead author, we created an AGN catalog from two MRS, including quite weak AGNs. And I looked at it, and sure enough, there was one within the, the um, I think Localization area. 50 degree uh, footprint. And yet, when I tried to find out about the deck cam survey, it was not sensitive enough to have looked, to have seen a differential uh, had it been on the AGN. And I just wanted to know how would one lobby or who would, who should I approach if I wanted to try to get the powers that be? I'm not sure whether it's deck cam that should be. Uh, I have regretted so what would <laughs> I have a graduate student ramping up to work on this problem. So we maybe should talk more because um, I am really interested in this and it turns out to be really tough. So, okay, so here, uh, uh, what we found out so far, right? So number one, in our beautiful pipeline, one of the things that we reject at the start are, um, Variable of ob variable objects that we know are already in the in the you know in the image. So all of those AGNs, they are not present. Not even if you want to to I to see. go back and look. I see. It's yeah. even worse than I realized. Yeah. <laughs> and the idea and the idea of rejecting those is that um, the thinking um, <laughs> at the time was we didn't want to get fooled by variable stars. You know, so every, you know, point that is there that is varying, that has variability and so on, that shows up as a transient, a known, you know, point, 
I, we just throw it out. We cut a circle, literally, <laughs> around it and, and throw them out. So now we need to, to do things differently. And one of the, the exercises that this student uh, did at first was to go back and look at the catalogs of AGMs. And I likely looked at your catalog, <laughs> actually, and try to match with the positions um, inside of the images that we, we took before doing the subtraction and try to do sub image subtraction only in those locations, right? Now, that's not working yet because then we run into other types of problems, which is um, a, to get a good subtraction close to a bright, you know, to the, the core of a bright galaxy, it, it's not working as well as we had hoped in the first pass. So it requires some more, um, you know, more attention, uh, I would say. Okay. Um, and then, and this would be only with the data that we already have, right? Uh, other things that we would need to do in order, because once we can detect that there is something uh, that we can detect reliably, right, the, how many photons you're getting at that point in time from that, that variable source, the next thing is, how do I know that that is my uh, merger on top of an AGN that is varying intrinsically? Well, I, you know, we had a, uh, a, 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 first he was a visiting master's student, and then he returned mm -hmm. and, and was working with me, and he and I discuss, discovered the first optical tidal disruption events using SCSS data, Stuart Van Velsen. And now there's a huge, and of course, it's a similar problem to finding tidal disruption events around supermassive black mm -hmm. holes. And so the techniques are extremely well developed now, and you should be incorporating those. So I'll, I'll, let's definitely talk. Uh, there's uh, That would be great. Yes, I think that this is an exciting problem because, I mean, if the dark sirens are exciting, uh, they are even more exciting if we can get at least a, a subset of those to actually, uh, uh, you know, be incorporated in the bright side of the analysis. That would be great. Right. Right. And also for the intrinsic opportunity to study that kind of system in their in their oh, absolutely yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Let's we'll definitely talk uh, offline. Yeah. Great. Uh, are there any other questions from graduate students, especially? Um, yeah, if not, maybe uh, we can stick around a little bit more, but let's thank uh, Marcel Suarez Santos again for, for a great talk. Thank you. And uh, I'll, I'll stop the recording now, but we can stick around a little bit uh, for an informal chat, perhaps. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for the, the talk.